the largest of all mega movers is the Panama Canal. For a century, it's been the shipping shortcut of the world. But this 19th century marvel has struggled to keep up with 21st century demand. There are now more ships than ever on the high seas, and if the canal can't push them through, they'll take their business elsewhere. It's make or break time for this mega mover, and it'll take an army of men and machines for it to keep up with the competition. of skyscrapers can haul massive loads and often face tight deadlines. And they're germ-packed in one of the world's busiest waterways, the Panama Canal. Nearly 200 million tons of goods, from food to electronics to fuel, cross this narrow waterway each year. Sliced through Central America, the canal links the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Instead of a four-week trek around South America, it allows vessels to cut across in 10 hours. But that's not all. This engineering marvel also does something incredible. It lifts ships 25 meters up and over a mountain range. The man-made passage is a massive mega-mover, powered by an ingenious lock system and a team of mighty machines. Stretching for 80 kilometers, it boosts ships nearly eight stories up and across an entire country. Two lanes, each made up of three narrow lock chambers, lift or lower ships on each side. In between the locks, vessels must tackle sprawling Gatun Lake and the snake-like Gaylord Cut. But the canal is more than a shortcut. It's also a business. And these ships are customers, paying up to a quarter of a million US dollars for one day transit. Now the aging canal is facing its biggest challenge in a century, keeping up with modern day demand. The number of ships using it has skyrocketed from 1,000 a year in 1914 to 14,000 today. Delays and congestion are common, so more and more ships are turning to the competition, the Suez Canal in Egypt. This wider, deeper waterway can handle more traffic and larger ships. Panama wants to keep pace with its competitor, it'll have to push through more ships than ever before. Two giant vessels are speeding towards it from opposite directions, and both will push the canal's machines to their limits. The southbound container ship, the Meti Maersk, is heading from the east coast of the United States to the Far East and she's anxious to be on her way. Stretching 300 meters long and 30 across, she's classified as a Panamax, the largest ship the canal can handle. At the opposite end, a towering car carrier named the Kentucky Highway is closing in on the Pacific Locks. This northbound ship is delivering vehicles from Japan to the southern United States. But the ship's staggering 10-story height makes her incredibly hard to control, and if she runs into trouble, traffic could back up for several kilometers. As if that weren't enough, the canal is also up against another challenge, one it hasn't faced in 15 years. At sunset, workers must replace a four-story, 400-ton gate at the Atlantic Locks. It's a job for the floating crane, 
Titan. But to install the gate, Titan will have to block an entire lane, cutting traffic flow in half. The canal can't spare more than four hours for the operation. But workers can't turn their attention to the gate just yet. The Metimersk is heading straight for them, barreling down on the Atlantic locks. With containers stacked six high and 13 wide, she weighs 56,000 tons. She's a monster, even for the canal's champion powerlifter, the Triple Locks. Each of the three lock chambers stretches 300 meters, nearly long enough for the Eiffel Tower to lie flat. Some locks are so high that six lorries could sit on top of each other, and a single chamber can pack in nearly 3,000 buses. When they were built, the locks were the largest in the world, but today's vessels like the Meti push them to their limits. The container ship will have just five meters to spare at either end and only 60 centimeters on the sides. She can't make it through alone because she'd risk hitting the lock walls and crumpling her hull or slamming into the gates causing costly damage. So the canal calls in a team of men and machines to position the Meti perfectly. At 6 a.m., the canal's elite pilots take the helm. They have to train for eight years before they can navigate this tricky waterway. Captain, how are you? Welcome to the Panama Canal. Captain Eric Christensen has successfully steered this container ship 16,000 kilometers from Hong Kong. But even the most experienced captain must relinquish control here. Okay, Roger. The Meti is too big for just one pilot. She needs three. Stationed on the wing, bridge and bow, the pilots can't take their eyes off any part of her, even for a second. Raoul Foyer is the bow pilot. We're trying to drive um, steel ships into concrete um, boxes, and inherently that's dangerous right there. It's time to rein her in. Two rowers attach the ship to the approach wall. The canal needs raw strength to pull the Meti in. And these are the mighty mules that do the job. They may look small next to the ship, but they pack a powerful punch. Each one can pull 35 tons. But at 56,000 tons, the Meti's so heavy that eight mules strain to pull her forward without smashing the sides. They have just centimeters to spare. The bow pilot orders the mules to tighten or loosen their cables to control the ship's speed. So what I'm doing is basically playing with vectors, like in school, you know, and so I'm, you know, pulling, letting go a little bit on one side and pulling on the other side. Finally, she's in. It's time for the locks to show their strength. Down below, the lock floor erupts. 100 valves blast open and water explodes out. 98 million liters shoot from the upper lock to the lower one without the help of pumps. It's gravity that creates this awesome force, an amazing feat in a system that's 100 years old. 
After one more boost, the Meti clears the first hurdle. Our pilots can relax for a moment. But trouble is looming 80 kilometers away. The canal is about to take on the northbound car carrier, the Kentucky Highway. A ship even trickier than the Meti Maersk. The canal's machines must perform perfectly or they'll lose control of her. And this backed up waterway can't afford any accidents. The Kentucky Highway speeds towards the Panama Canal's Pacific locks, set to enter early the next morning. Packed with expensive new automobiles, she's paid canal authorities nearly 200,000 US dollars, and she's a top priority. Her crew is depending on the canal pilots to keep their precious cargo safe. But the Kentucky Highway has just 72 hours to get these goods to the east coast of the United States. Luckily, this car carrier is more than a mega ship. She's also a speed demon. Because her cargo is lightweight, she sits high in the water. That means less underwater resistance and a lot more speed. But being lightweight and tall creates two major flaws. With less ballast, she's difficult to control. And in bad weather, she wobbles and could tip over. Before sunrise, the Kentucky Highway pulls towards the Pacific locks. This approach is as hard as landing a jet on an aircraft carrier. The canal's crews and mighty machines are ready and waiting. But one of the ship's trademark flaws rears its ugly head. The canal's machines lose control. And the ship slams into the wall. Fortunately, she's not seriously damaged. But the pilots can't dwell in the collision. With ships lined up behind them, they have to steer the Kentucky Highway through the narrow locks. The ship has to pass through three lock chambers. The first is at sea level, but the canal's waters are 25 meters above sea level. As the sun rises, the locks unleash a torrent of water, performing another weightlifting feat. The ship shoots up nearly three stories in eight minutes. When the water levels are equal, the front gates open, and the Kentucky Highway teeters forward. Then the whole process repeats. Two locks down, one to go. The canal has to deal with a different challenge at the Atlantic locks. A 400-ton gate is ready to be installed, and the canal can't perform this major maintenance without a power lifter. This is Titan. Standing 23 stories high, it's a floating crane on a tight schedule. Gate installation used to take 10 hours, but tonight, Titan will attempt it in four. Even that briefer holdup will prevent six ships from transiting and cost the canal more than 300,000 US dollars. The operation won't be easy. Titan has to connect the gate in two places. The first is underwater where the gate pivots, and the second is above water on a narrow hinge. And each gate is enormous, standing an average of six storeys high and weighing as much as three 747s. 
Before Titan can get started above water, the canal's divers need to make sure everything's ready below the surface. The head diver takes the plunge. His sidekick, a motorized diving camera, is lured in after him. With other divers watching from above, the head diver checks the lock wall. It has to be in perfect condition for the gate to be watertight. Then he goes down to the very bottom to make sure the underwater pivot point called the pintle ball is clear. Any rocks or debris could block installation. Everything's set. The divers are done for the day. But the motorized camera remains on site, just in case. Eighty kilometers away, on the Pacific side of the canal, the Kentucky Highway is in the final lock chamber and preparing to exit. Mules no longer control the ship, and in these narrow confines, the risk of collision is high. As the pilot pulls away, both he and the captain realize they have a serious problem. The ship next to them is pulling out at the same time, and they're too close to each other. Suction pulls both of them backwards. Should they collide, the Kentucky's hull could be sliced open and the ship could sink. The ships displace enough water to fill 12 Olympic-sized swimming pools. And they leave a sort of footprint in their wake. When the ships accelerate, water rushes into these footprints, creating backward suction that can overpower forward thrusting engines. The bow of the other ship is now on a crash course with the Kentucky Highway's stern. The Kentucky Highway is sandwiched between the approaching ship on one side and moored vessels on the other. And to make matters worse, tugs are on the outside of both ships and in no position to help. The other ship tries to slow down, but her bow only turns harder towards the Kentucky. The Kentucky's pilot gives the order to thrust forwards. All anyone can do now is wait and hope. There's only one place in the entire Panama Canal where giant ships meet head to head, Gatun Lake. The container ship, the Meti Maersk, has just entered it. This is the only stretch wide enough for two-way traffic. The lake is big and canal workers can only maintain a safe depth in a small section of it. Turns here are so tight that ships are often on a collision course. Starboard 20. And with the record number of container ships in the lake, the pressure is on to navigate perfectly. Visibility is crucial here, but today it's raining. The rainy season lasts a solid eight months in Panama. And along with torrential downpours, it can also bring dense fog, a pilot's worst nightmare. Any day, anything can happen. It's very difficult to predict the weather here in Panama. And there's another problem. The pilot's view is blocked. The Meti is so long and stacked so high that all he can see in front of him is ship.
He uses buoys in the lake to navigate. Usually he can see eight buoys, but because of the rain, today he can see only three. When we cannot see the buoys, then we are in trouble. You don't feel like you know where you are, even with the radar, it's, it's kind of scary. So the Panama Canal has equipped its navigators with high-tech tools, specialized laptops outfitted with GPS and maritime databases pinpoint the pilot's vessel and other ships in the canal. Right now, his tools tell him that another vessel is dead ahead. In other waters, the crew would never navigate this close to another ship. The risk of collision would be too high. With the gap between the ships closing fast, the pilot must multitask at every moment. We have to be listening to the radio to see what's happening ahead. If the visibility is reducing or is increasing or if the times are changing, we have to be listening to the radio all the time and be aware of the weather. Make ship steady. Steady. What's your heading now? One to six. One to eight. One to eight. He never knows when disaster could strike. And these two container ships are meeting at the worst possible place. A sharp turn. Is to ten. Main ships. Main ships. The pilot increases the METI speed for better control and a faster turn. Tries to stay away from him, looking at the buoys and not too close to the buoys, not too close to him. Just try to stay in the center. Everyone watches apprehensively. Both pilots have huge blind spots. The METI's pilot can't even see the other ship until it's less than 100 meters away. But the two massive vessels make it. But the crew can't breathe a sigh of relief yet because the rain is getting worse. I said that there is no visibility, no visibility here in uh, Gatun uh, Reach, over. In zero visibility, ships need to stop completely. Even with GPS, navigation is impossible. Waiting for the weather to lift could take all night. The rain has already put the Meti Mersk and her goods behind schedule. The canal can't afford another delay. The Meti is a high-paying customer, and the canal has promised her passage by day's end. The pilot calls to a vessel ahead, hoping for good news. Yeah, OK, is that getting worse or improving over there? Well, for me, it's getting worse. It was better uh, by some problem, but now it's... Uh... Uh, it's, uh, looks, a little, looks like it's not up uh, from east to west. I can see the east a lot better than I can see the west. Or... Okay, Roger. Uh, seems like it's improving around here, but uh, uh, you said it's getting worse over there. So. With the narrowest, most difficult part of the canal fast approaching, the pilots must hope for the best and prepare for the worst. The link between the Panama Canal's Gatun Lake and the Pacific Locks is called the Cut. It's the one stretch that intimidates even the most experienced navigators. This link is terrifyingly narrow, with sharp twists and turns. The sides and base are solid rock, and one wrong move could slice a ship's hull straight open. That's what happened to this bulk carrier in 2001. It's great bottom and the hull flooded, partially sinking the ship. Blasted directly through the continental divide, the cut sits on two tectonic plates and constant geologic activity has created especially unstable rock. 
As a result, several hundred million tons of soil above ground tumble into the cut every year. The only way to keep the passage clear is with the world's biggest underwater earth movers. This demolition duo is made up of Baru, one of the newest, most powerful drill barges on the planet, and the Christiansen, the biggest dipper dredge boat in the world. Together, they've moved more dirt than the original workers did to build the canal. And now they're on a mission to make it bigger and better. Between them, they'll prepare the canal for the next generation of super ships. Container ships like the Savannah Express are 30 meters longer than the Meti Maersk and almost 10 meters wider, and vessels are getting bigger. There are more orders for post packs, the larger size, the ones that cannot fit through the canal. Those are the ones that are in order, and so if we don't follow along with those trains, we're going to be left behind. Panama is already losing customers to the Suez Canal the only other shortcut between Asia and the U.S. East Coast. That route takes longer, but the Suez is bigger and, by some accounts, cheaper. So the Panama Canal has unveiled its most ambitious plan since the waterway was built, a $5 billion expansion project. Its most impressive feature is a third set of locks that will hold twice as much water and extend 120 meters longer. This expansion will double the canal's capacity. It means that the cut needs to get bigger too. And not just for future ships, but for today's giant fleet. It's a three-step plan. First, they'll straighten the sides. Then, they'll deepen the bottom. And finally, they'll widen the waterway. The straightening isn't a problem. Land-based crews obliterate the cut sides with explosives. But some of the soil is resting on rock. So for step two, deepening, the canal needs its rock star, Baru. Just three months old, this high-tech drill barge is the pride of the Panama Canal. Its deck alone is bigger than two tennis courts. It stands 10 stories high, and its powerful drills can dive more than 25 meters. Peru's underwater mission is to plant explosives 14 meters below and detonate them. With more giant ships today than ever before, the canal is counting on Baru to clear the way. The drills shoot downwards until they hit bottom. Then they bore a further nine meters deeper. Next, it's time for the explosives. Each of these yellow tubes contains three kilograms of explosive, but workers need to pack more than 60 kilograms into the bar. They attach a detonation line, and the explosives head underwater. A styrofoam block marks each explosive hole. For today's massive blast, there are 40 holes packed with a total of 1,500 kilograms of explosive. Workers then have to get out of the way. They have just five minutes to get clear.
they need to do the blast between transiting ships. If a boat is within 600 meters, it could be hit by flying rock. The countdown begins. Two thousand five hundred cubic meters of solid rock are obliterated. Now it's time for step three, widening. For this step, the canal calls in Baru's partner, the Christiansen. Weighing a massive four thousand two hundred tons, this machine is the world's biggest dipper dredge. Its crowning feature is a massive head that can lift the weight of eight buses. It works non-stop to deepen the cut, continuing a century's worth of dredging. Pete Barotta is the captain. If we stop dredging within a year or two, there wouldn't be enough water to pass the size ships that we pass now. Soil and silt are no problem for the machine's giant mouth, but there are some things even it can't swallow. Often the Baru's blasts create boulders that won't fit through the Christiansen's mouth. Left alone, a boulders like this could tilt in the churning waters of the cut and gash a ship's hull. So they have to be blown up something workers here tend to enjoy. The claw holds the boulder steady and workers drill straight into its center. Then the foreman carefully inserts three packets of explosive. Boulder is lowered just below the water's surface for detonation. It's blown to bits. The cut is ready for the Kentucky Highway. But back at the Pacific Locks, the Kentucky Highway isn't ready for the cut. The car carrier is on a collision course with another ship. The Kentucky's pilot fights to pull her forward and radios the other vessel's pilot. The other ship stops, and finally the Kentucky stern clears. But it was far too close for comfort. In the Panama Canal's Gatun Lake, the rain is still coming down, drastically reducing visibility. And the container ship, the Meti Maersk, is in the thick of it. The head pilot has been on duty for eight stressful hours. Now he must hand over control to the final pilot. GPS shows that the Meti must cross paths with one more container ship before entering the cut. One zero, five. One zero five. As the ship approaches, the pilot expertly navigates past it. The Meti has finally reached the end of Gatun Lake. Next, it's the cut. But the bad weather has put her behind schedule. Even if things go perfectly, she may be stuck in the canal all night. And she can't power ahead yet because the Kentucky Highway 
is entering the cut on the opposite end. The car carrier has paid a premium to get through faster. But she's even harder to handle in the cut than she is in the locks. On sharp turns, the front looks perfectly stable. But the tail swings drastically and tilts. The Kentucky encounters her first hard turn. All the time you worry. <laughs> You have to keep an eye, especially with these car carriers. Javi Derbegozo has been a canal pilot for 16 years. His orders will make or break the ship's passage. The ship is leaning hard behind the bridge, but the pilot doesn't look back. He needs to concentrate on the route ahead and rely on instinct to steer the stern. The Kentucky Highway clears the first turn, and then three more. At the end of the cut, she faces one final test. She has to squeeze past the demolition duo just 45 meters away. She sails past safely. This is where the cut ends and the lake begins. But half of the canal still lies ahead of the ship and daylight is fading fast. At the canal's Atlantic locks, the mighty floating crane Titan is pulling in. It's hauling a newly refurbished gate that's ready to be reinstalled. Titan's crew is up against a tight deadline. The canal needs them to clear the lane by midnight to avoid any further costly traffic backups. But the crew can't rush. Every step requires precision. One mistake and the gate could break during a ship's transit, bringing traffic to a standstill. Step one is sinking the gate. Next, Titan has to balance the gate on the pintel ball, the bottom pivot point. Titan's powerful hydraulic lifts push the gate forward. The foreman could use underwater cameras to ensure the gate is in place, but gut instinct tells him that Titan got it right on the first try. Step three is sliding the gate into the top joint. The crane needs to get the gate perfectly level for it to fit properly. The margin of error is just one tenth of a millimeter. Leveling something this huge is no easy task. In the past, the crew has tried GPS, lasers, and other state of the art toys to assist them. But believe it or not, the most reliable tool they've found is a $2 level. The foreman checks and the gate looks good. He calls on Titan to move the gate in. The first attempt doesn't quite succeed. The foreman thinks that Titan can jostle it into place, and he tries again. Suddenly, he tells Titan to stop. The crane barely brushed the gate against the lock wall, but it was enough to crumble concrete. 
Crew members begin to question whether the gate was sitting correctly to start with. Luckily, a diver is standing by, and the underwater camera gets in on the action. It shows that Titan did get it right. The gate is on the pencil ball. But there's also bad news. The brush with cement broke part of the wall away, and that piece is now sitting where the gate will eventually rest. Right now, the foreman can't worry about that. He needs to focus on attaching the joint. It's frustrating work. A task that can take as little as 30 minutes has now taken twice that, and the gate isn't even in place. The workers are feeling the pressure, and ships are fast approaching. They say that Titan has never had this much trouble aligning a gate. The entire operation is behind schedule, and if Titan can't get this gate in on time, the backups will stretch into both oceans. In the Panama Canal's infamous Gaylord Cut, the Metimersk gets a pleasant surprise. The rain has finally stopped. But rough weather has put this container ship behind schedule, and there's nothing the pilot can do to make up time. The only safe speed here is an agonizing 15 kilometers an hour. He takes turns cautiously, mindful of the rocky bottom that could gash the ship's hull. But the demolition duo did their job well, and the Meti proceeds without a single scrape. When she reaches the Centennial Bridge, the Meti Maersk has made it through the cut. The Pacific locks are up next. The sun is setting, and it's dangerous for the Meti to attempt the locks in the dark. But canal authorities decide they have to push the ship through, because ports around the world are relying on her. The sun has already set at the Atlantic locks, as Titan and its crew struggle to install the massive gate. Their four-hour deadline has come and gone. Ships are now just minutes away, and tonight's transits depend on them. The 23-story crane lines up the joint holes to insert a pin. Then, once they're aligned, it has to hold the gate perfectly still. The fit requires a little wiggling. The pin goes in part of the way. But these chalk marks need to line up, and they're off by almost eight centimeters. The workers need to rotate the 225 kilogram pin. They use a low-tech method to do this. But it works, and the pin goes in. Workers attach a hydraulic jack to open and close the gate. Then the welders go to work. After a grueling four and a half hours, the 400-ton gate is set. Now it's time to see if it can stand on its own. Titan's claw releases, and the gate remains standing and secure. But the million-dollar question is, does it work? The powerful gate hits the chunk of concrete and crushes it. 
Nothing is getting in this gate's way tonight. Titan takes a bow and exits. The Kentucky Highway pulls into the Atlantic locks without a scratch. Two more steps down through one final set of gates and she's back in open water, heading towards her final destination. The canal has saved her four weeks at sea. At the Pacific Locks, the Meti makes her final exit, giving canal workers something big to celebrate. Their team of mega machines has pulled through nearly twice as many container ships as they ever have before. It's one for the record books and three more success stories for a 19th century canal working tirelessly to keep up with 21st century demands. Another fleet of mega ships will descend on her tomorrow and when it does, the canal's team of mighty machines will be ready and waiting. Mm -hmm.